Thank you so much, Angelica, for kindly inviting me to talk with you guys. It's really nice to be here, and uh, I'm really glad that you also think the topic of teacher well-being is important. So uh, it's nice to see that it's getting an airing as a topic. Um, I structured the talk today. I decided the guide was to try and make it kind of practical. But if you want to stop me at any point along the way, or you want to talk about any of the research or any of the other things, then please do. But I decided that we we kind of focus on how to get ourselves in a better place. And trust me. If I had all the magic answers and secrets to this, I, I wouldn't be researching it. <laughs> I think there's a little bit of self-interest in my research here. Um, so it is, my research kind of started with this notion is, you know, what is the most important resource in language teaching? And the, the most important thing fundamentally is, is you. you. You are the ones <laughs> that are the most important. So the teachers themselves make a massive difference to what happens in the classroom. And as I started to research, I started to realize that um, there was actually very little work looking at the psychology of teachers. So a lot of the research, understandably so, looks at the psychology of learners, but there was nowhere near the same breadth um, of research looking at teachers. And as a kind of key stakeholder in the classroom, this just struck me as strange. And so that's how my kind of research interest started in this. One of the things that we have come to understand more clearly is that teacher and learner well-being are two sides of the same coin. So as the teacher in the classroom, so for those of you who have an interest in the theory, from a, from a complex dynamic systems perspective, the teacher is the hub. It's the center of the network, the social network in the classroom. So our psychology is incredibly influential for our learners. We're also influenced by their psychology, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment, but our psychology, our well-being, influences very strongly the sort of climate and the ethos of the classroom that we create. And I've also put here and colleagues who are also very susceptible to the mood of our colleagues, and particularly those who are in charge of the department, that their ethos, their well-being also filters down and is sort of affected both ways. And I think one of the things that we have that I think is quite important to stress is that teacher well-being is not just an indulgent luxury. This isn't something that we just pay attention to because it's a, a momentary fashion or a fad. Um, teacher well-being is actually linked to higher quality instruction, more effective teaching, and ultimately, of course, then to higher levels of student achievement. So the teacher being in the right place psychologically is a win-win for everybody. Um, teachers themselves deserve to be in a good place, psychologically speaking, but also the learners benefit when teachers are in the right place. So there's a lot of good reasons why we should be focusing on teacher well-being and I would also say we should be looking at learner well-being, but that's, that's perhaps for another talk. Um, so one of the reasons in this sort of contagion, so you're, I'm sure you're very aware of the notion of mirror neurons and how we sort of are very susceptible to other people's emotions, particularly people who play a kind of central role. And that's why as teachers, our emotions are very salient to learners and they're very susceptible to the moods that we're in. And what can happen is two things that can fundamentally happen. If we're not in a good place with our teaching, if we're so struggling, sort of, if we're tired, if we're demotivated, if we're just not in the right place psychologically, the learners feel that and then they can disengage, they can be difficult, they don't want to do what they want to do, they show that they're bored or they're disengaged, we get more frustrated and so starts this burnout cascade, this downward spiral. And of course the opposite can also happen is that we get, as teachers, we, are, we get a lot of positivity from our relationship with learners. And so when we're in a good place and we're motivated and we're enjoying what we do and we're having fun with our teaching, the learners pick up on that and the likelihood that they're motivated is much higher. And when they're motivated and engaged, we get a buzz out of our teaching and so starts more virtuous cycle that we get a sort of upward spiral of positivity. So it's a fact, happy teachers make for happy pupils and vice versa. If our pupils are also happy and they're enjoying their studies, we tend to get also more positive resonance. Now, Perhaps comes up a little bit later on. So I'm just going to give you a bit of time now, as it's supposed to be a workshop, so I thought I'd give you time to talk. I don't know how we're logistically going to do this with feedback in a moment, but um, I'll leave that to you, Sam. I'm sure you've got it all covered. Um, just to take a moment and talk to the person near you, how much explicit attention do you give to your well-being? Or how much do you really actually sort of sit down and say, you know, what am I doing this week to look after myself? You know, what am I doing in terms of time? Um, what are you aware of that affects your well-being, positively or negatively, because of the things that can give you a boost and the things that can pull you down a little bit? And how do you feel about the way your well-being affects your work and your personal life? Let me just give you a couple of minutes to talk 
and then I'm not quite sure how I'm going to get you back under control, but I'll just, I'll say stop and wave my hand and hope that I can get to, get to hear some of your responses. Thank you. So very often, um, paying explicit attention to your well-being is sometimes, it's sometimes, not everybody, but some people have a kind of sense of a guilty conscience about it because you're supposed to be doing everything else and this is all more important. And I think we have to get over that sense of guilt and feel that it's actually okay to prioritize our well-being. It's actually perfectly okay to make that a priority for us, for our family, for our friends, um, and then to sort of work on it very consciously in the foreground of what we do. Um, you may have seen this quote before, and I absolutely hate and detest it with a passion. There is nothing at all about this that makes sense. It's an express road to burnout. Um, a teacher, a good teacher should never have to consume themselves in order to have to support others in their teaching. There's something drastically wrong if that's the situation. Um, I also wanted to make this point now. We still have, unfortunately, in the profession, and I don't really know enough about the American context to know if maybe it's different for you guys, but certainly where I work here in Austria, there's still quite a stigma attached to burnout and people are reluctant to talk about it. Um, so I really did want to say very explicitly, if you in any way feel that you do need some kind of professional support, please don't be shy about going and getting support. This is something that you, you should be able to get, I would have thought and say it's very good support for. And I know that Angelica talked about some of the wellbeing options at Cornell earlier. So what is well-being? Just to clarify what I mean by this so that there's no misunderstanding. So this is the Oxford Online Dictionary definition. The state of being comfortable, healthy, or happy. Well, for a start, I'd get rid of the or. It's all, it's all three of those things. Um, there's a term, for those who are interested more in the research side of things, there's a term called subjective well-being that's used a lot in the research literature, and we've been using it in some of the studies we've been doing. Um, it's comprised of three things. It's about having job satisfaction, being satisfied with your job and the job conditions and what you do. It's a lack of negative emotions and a presence of positive emotion. Now, this is really important to clarify. It doesn't mean no negative emotions. Negative emotions, negative experience, dips in motivation, that's part of life and that's quite a normal part of any job and any kind of work that you do. The point of well-being is that you have a balance more in favor of more positive emotions on a regular basis than the negative emotions. It is not saying that there are no negative emotions. And that's sometimes what is misunderstood about well-being, that it's all just about positivity, all just about happiness. That's not what well-being is about. It's about having a balance. And negative emotions can have functions. It's not just that they're negative. Sometimes the negative positivity labels, the balance labels are quite unfortunate because they lead to sort of slightly misunderstandings. The negative emotion can have very useful functions. So a certain degree of anxiety can actually be very motivating. A certain degree of... Um, Frustration can be very motivating and so on. So it's, it's about having the right kind of emotional balance in relation to the workplace. And the model that we've been using in our work that some of you may be familiar with from positive psychology is the notion of PERMA. And I'm just gonna, it's not, I'm not gonna focus on this too much today, but just for those who are interested to give you a background, it's not just about the more hedonistic view of positivity. It's not just about being happy. It's about finding meaning and purpose and having relationships that make sense. So PERMA is made out of these five different components, so positive emotions, but of course, they can also be what we call the quieter emotions, things like contentment, um, sense of peace. Um, so it doesn't have to be sort of, you know, giddy happy the whole time. Um, engagement, getting into flow, getting engaged with what we do, finding a lot of satisfaction and reward in what we do. Having positive relationships, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Finding meaning in what we do, seeing purpose, that's usually very easy for teachers to do. It's very, a strong part of teacher profile is having a job that is meaningful. And a sense of achievement doesn't mean achievement uh, or accomplishment in terms of worldly goods or, or it's accomplishing things that are meaningful to you is what is meant by that. And the thing that was added later and that's quite important for understanding well-being is the notion of vitality, which means physical health. Um, embodied mind, embodied cognition, we cannot separate the physical side and the mental. If you're physically in a good space, it helps you mentally, and if you're mentally in a good space, it helps you physically. So that's another part of it that's in, in part of the model. So what well-being is not is bashing out the negative, pretending that everything is okay, pretending, suppressing any kind of negative emotions and negative experiences. It's about recognizing those and learning how to engage with them and deal with them rather than suppressing them. 
So rather ambitiously, with half an hour to go, I've got five areas to look at. I'm just going to go through them briefly and just give you a little bit of a sort of flavour of ideas um, of things that you can think about. And I chose the sort of five key things, five key areas that are perhaps the most important to think about. Um, given the time, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an idea for all of them and then you can perhaps go off and explore more. Or feel free, please do feel free that you can contact me by email if you'd like to carry on the conversation after today's session. So I'll look first at the notion of stress. Um, this is one of my favourite, favourite quotes about teaching and I'll just let you read it for a second. So I love this quote because uh, anybody who's been a teacher recognises this and it might be referring to classroom teaching but you know if you're teaching at university there's a, there's a lot you can recognise in there as well or certainly in my context. Um, it's not to say that teaching will ever be a stress-free job, it's not. Teaching is inherently stressful in the kinds of demands that it makes in the class but also in the preparation, the admin, the surrounding situation. So it's not about again denying or getting rid of stress. It's about learning to manage that and learning to live with it. Stress is part of the job. It's not necessarily always a bad thing. It's the amount of perceived stress that matters. So this is a quite a useful definition of stress here. Stress occurs when there's a mismatch between perceived pressures of the work situation and an individual's ability to cope with it. So what's quite interesting about this, so the thing that I find quite empowering, is that this is the notion that stress is a perception. It's not an actual thing. It can express itself physically. But it comes about as a sense, as a perception. We perceive that something is too much. We perceive we can't manage it. But that's quite important because it means that there's things we can do to manage that perception and to manage our, our how we experience stress. Now, I'm not going to talk today about chronic long-term stress and stressful life events. So chronic long-term stress, for example, is having to care for somebody in the family who is maybe aging or who's got a long-term illness. And a stressful life event can be moving house. Um, getting a divorce and um, these are sort of big stresses and they contribute if you like to your base level of stress and what I'm really talking about are the daily stresses and strains the hassles and your ability to cope with these hassles on a daily basis is strongly affected by how much of the background stuff you have going on so we all know that there are certain periods of time where we can cope more easily with things and then there are other periods of time where the slightest thing um, can just feel like too much though. So I know that there are certain times of the year when I blow my car horn a lot more than at other times of the year. Um, let me give you a moment to talk about some of the things that cause you stress in your professional roles. What are some of the stresses in your settings? And uh, I'll call on Sam to, to, to get everybody back on track again afterwards. Go ahead, let me give you a couple of minutes to talk about this. Okay, I'll show you some of the ones that have come up. Some of the things that come up, they've been researched mostly with teachers in secondary school, but some of them may resonate. <laughs> So things like challenging students, so difficult students, um, difficult colleagues, uh, poor management, oversized classes, exam pressures, reforms, increased administration, um, excessive work demands, um, conflicting role and identity issues. So this came up with people who had children who felt that their time was being split in different directions. Um, some people, for example, in Austria, they changed job expectations, so they didn't volunteer to teach CLIL, but ended up teaching CLIL. Um, some people found technologies, temporary work contracts, and certain job conditions, and I'm sure there are plenty of others on your own. Um, but stress is not inevitable. So when you actually understand that stress is a perception, it actually becomes quite, it's quite interesting then to reflect on your own sources of stress. And there's no one solution for this, and everybody has to unfortunately kind of find your own way. If I can't give you like a med magic recipe, because it changes, it changes for the individual, um, what causes you stress at one moment in time, you deal with quite differently at another moment in time. Um, but the key question to ask about your stresses, so once you've identified what your stresses are, is can I change it? Is it in my locus of control? What can I do about it? Is there something that I can actually change about that stressor? Can I put myself in a position that I don't have to encounter it? Um, can I make it less prominent in my life? Can I work with some aspect of it differently? Um, is there something about it that I can change? It's the sort of key question. And then you start to realize that very often there's a little bit more to, that we can change than we think there is. And then the ultimate, if you really, really can't change anything about it, is that you can restructure how you think about it, that you can change the way you perceive the stressor. Um, can I think of an example? So a really silly, a simple example perhaps is, um, I, 
uh, I'm kind of well known in my family as having the patience of a boiling kettle. I have no patience. And I hate being late for things. I think it's because I've been asked for too long. And so I, I hate being delayed. I hate being late. And so I used to get really frustrated when trains were late, which is very rare in Austria. Trains are late, but certainly at airports and so on. But I just completely changed the way I look at it now. So I've made it a kind of treat. So if something is late, I allow myself to read. It's a, a luxury time now. And so actually I sort of have a secret wish now that maybe it'll be a little bit late and I can have a bit read for pleasure. So if you can't change the thing that's causing you stress, you can perhaps change the way you perceive it. And I think this is important to stress. Not all stress is bad. Um, there's a certain, the yerkes dodson law is this curve, which is for all kinds of things, but there's a certain amount of stress actually brings out a top performance. So we actually, some of us function well when we've got certain, but that amount is different for everybody. So you have to be careful not to compare yourself to other people. Everybody has their own tipping point. Everybody has their own point at which they can function well. And then a point after which they say, for me now, this is too much. I, I'm not functioning as well as I should function. And like I say, that point is different for everybody. So I think it's quite important that we don't compare ourselves to others and say, well, she's managing all that. Why am I not managing all that? Everybody experiences that a little bit differently. Now, we've talked all about this negative stuff now and this sort of negative feel. And actually, one of the things I wanted to say is it's really important to have these kind of conversations. It's really nice that you guys meet there at lunchtime and that you can talk about this with each other. Because it's quite good to have this sort of therapeutic sort of talking about it. But we have to be careful that we don't dwell into this toxic downward spiral of having a bit of a whinge and a moan. Um, and it's nice to look at also the uplift. This is the other side of well-being. So well-being is not just the opposite of sickness. It's not just the opposite. You have coping strategies to deal with stress, and a lot of the well-being literature has focused on that. But actually, you can also actively boost positivity and stress, uh, uplift. So uplifts are these positive experiences we have on a daily basis. And sometimes we stop noticing them because we focus very much on the negativity. So um, an example, for example, of this negative bias would be that if you look in a class of 20 learners and you have one learner who gives you negative feedback, but 19 say how brilliant your course was, I at least will obsess about that one person who said they didn't enjoy the course. And this can happen in our daily lives that we become much more aware of the things that didn't go right. And we almost take for granted the things that go well. So this aspect of well-being is learning to sort of reprogram ourselves to be a little bit more aware and notice a little bit more the things that we're grateful for, the things that are going well. Um, let me give you a chance to just talk a little bit now. What do you love about your job? Um, what do you find positive about your job? Maybe why you became a teacher um, and the things that give you a lot of pleasure in your job. I'll just give you a couple of minutes to talk about the positive side of things now for a change. What's really nice for me, and I'm only at this end, so I'm a long, long way away, but there's a lot more positivity and smiling and laughing in the room, which is nice. Um, so even, <laughs> yes. even without being it. So one of the things that happens is, is when we think, we just have to think about positive things, and we actually automatically start to feel better. And if you compare how you felt just talking about the stresses and how you felt talking about the positive things, you actually feel it. And I, I can feel it by a by a zoom by a long distance away you feel a different sense in the room so <laughs> focusing on the positives um is just one way to help boost your well-being by just creating a little bit more of that positive emotion um i put here some of the things that people have said about why they like being a teacher and some of the things that have come from research in other places um and one of the things i want to just point out on this list here is there's nothing wrong with having practical reasons for wanting your job and again, this is sort of part of going back to the fact that um, as teachers, we work really hard and we work really hard for many parts of the large parts of the year. There's no reason to be embarrassed that you like flexible working hours or having a summer break. Um, I don't think teachers should feel apologetic about that. I think there's very good reasons why there was a longer summer break. and I, I don't think any teacher should feel that they need to apologize for that. Just to explain why positive emotions have this effect. So some of you may know Barbara Fredrickson and her work in positive psychology. Quite honestly, Krashen was there, but didn't really have the same reasoning or know why he was there in terms of his effective filter. But positive emotions, what they've shown in their research is that actually when we're experiencing something positive, when we're in a positive frame or state, we're actually much more receptive and open to doing new things, trying new things, talking with new people. And we actually then try out new things. We're a little bit more experimental. We try out, we've got a little bit more of a sense of risk. We engage with people a little bit more, and that actually improves our resources and so on. So we start this kind of 
it calls it broaden and build theory. So positive emotions don't just feel good in the moment, they actually, in the long-term perspective, actually broaden our resources and our experience of how we think, experience life. So the one strategy that has got quite strong research evidence that it does lead to higher well-being is gratitude practices. And I realize that for some people, it depends on who you are, this may feel like a little bit funky and other people out there, but I have to admit that I've been doing it for a couple of years and I won't miss a day of doing it. I actually love doing this at the end of the day. Now, supposedly it works more effectively if you write it down, but I have to admit that I'm a little bit lazy and so I don't write it down myself. But before I go to bed at night, before I switch the light out, I just sit and just think about what am I thankful for today? What went well? What did I enjoy? What gave me pleasure? Um, you know, what things do I appreciate from the day? And doing that every day before I go to sleep at night. One, it puts me in good spirits with going to sleep so I tend to sleep better. But it just starts to train your mind to see the positive experiences. It just helps you to see the positivity more. If I think about the beginning of when I started to do this a couple of years ago, I had to sort of really sit and think, okay, so what was positive from today? And now at the end of the day, I can, I could, I can list hundreds of things because there's actually so many things to be grateful for and many of the things we just sort of take for granted. So this is a sort of relatively easy, um, very simple way, and it's been shown empirically to be quite a strong indicator then of well-being. Um, so take, take time at the end of the day to just think about things you're grateful for, or good things that happened to you this week. So take some time to just have a reflect on the things that you appreciate from today. And if you can try and make that a habit, um, it's one way of helping you to start through the positives more easily and get that balance in your well-being of uplift a little bit more. Recently, I have been reading that you're supposed to do your gratitude practices in the morning. Because, of course, you can choose your mood and you can affect your mood. And if you do your gratitude practices in the morning, it can put you in a positive frame of mind for the whole day. And it makes really good sense. But I have to admit, I haven't tried it yet because my mornings don't seem to run in that kind of sort of peaceful mode, I have to admit. So theoretically, I can see how it would work. But I, haven't, I can't really say that I've managed it myself just yet. And the other thing that I've put in here um, is a positivity portfolio, which might sound a bit weird and funky. But actually, it's nothing more that when, as a teacher, so let me have a look what I've got here that I can probably show you. So I've got, I'm not sure that's it, but I've got like cards, you know, let me show you, I can see that. Um, that one's about wine, so I'm not sure that's a really good example, but still. Um, my students give me, they give you thank you cards, or you have a nice teaching experience, or something pleasant happens, that you keep them somewhere. And that when you have a, maybe a dip in your motivation, which is inevitably going to happen at some point, you can just take them out and remind yourself about the lovely things about your job and the positive experiences you've had, the appreciative students you've had, the nice colleagues you work with, those kinds of things. Um, and this is basically a bit of a trick. So the question is what you see in the box. And yes, it is a bit of a trick. And I'll just give you a second to... Of course, a lot of people will focus on the blue dot, but there's a lot of white space around it. And of course, in terms of positivity and negativity, you get a lot of what you focus on. There's a lot about self-fulfilling prophecies. But the more that we can develop some of the positivity, again, it isn't denying the negative. It's just bringing a balance to look at some of the positivity that's in our lives. The more it can help us to have that sense of positivity and balance. So a third thing that I said that I would talk about was positive relations. And this is always a bit difficult to talk about when I'm not there and I don't know the situation where you are. But we all know that working in a positive working culture um, is very important for the well-being. So in some of the research we've been doing, the relationships in the workplace are quite defining and the quality of the culture in the workplace is quite defining for their well-being. And in fact, whether some people have stayed or left their jobs. And I'm going to take it as a very positive sign that Cornell have asked me to talk about well-being. So I'm going to take that as a very positive sign about your working culture, your working climate. Um, but this one is a kind of interesting one to talk about because it makes you think about all your relationships in your life, not just in the workplace, but also with your family and your friends. And it's also good when you're talking about your group dynamics and working with learners in the classroom. It all applies to all of these things that apply to it. And um, just take a moment. Have I got time? Yeah, I've just got time. Um, take a moment just with your partners. What is it people want out of a relationship? And I'm talking about any relationship now. What are the things that are really important to people in their relationships? Just let me give you a minute or two. <laughs> Well, that says a lot about relationships, how important they are and how we, got, we have strong feelings about what we want in our relationships generally. And um, these are some of the things that people listed. Maybe it resonates with the things that you were talking about. 
um, a sense of respect, trust and honesty, reciprocity, a bit of give and take, um, acceptance, um, open communication, equality, warmth, reliability, being able to rely on someone, feeling comfortable and enjoying being together, having fun together. Um, and that applies to any relationship. So whether it's in the workplace, whether it's colleagues, whether it's in the classroom, your learners, your relationship with the learners, these are some of the key characteristics that define a good relationship. And I've kind of, some of the research that we've been doing with social emotional learning, we've boiled it down to kind of three things. Um, and this probably is because I'm British, so I probably chose the acronym because of that, I suppose. Um, developing a sense of trust, showing empathy for the other person, and appreciating the other person, showing appreciation for who they are when they do something, that you understand their perspective, those kinds of things. So relationships take effort. Um, there's very few relationships that function without any kind of investment. And it's worth, um, it's worth taking time to consider which relationships are important to us within the workplace, but also outside of the workplace, because we get a lot of strength from our social networks and our relationships. And sometimes when we're really busy and really stressed, the thing that we neglect the most are the relationships that are probably the most important to us. Sometimes because we know we can rely on them, but sometimes we actually need to be able to take time to invest in those relationships to get the quality back. Um, and some relationships need more investment of time and energy than others, and some are worth more investment of time and energy than others. And the key to relational quality it's daily interactions. So it's not just the big things, it's those little things. It's just saying, hi, how was your weekend? How's your daughter doing? Um, just little bits of conversations. And relational quality doesn't come from sort of big gestures. It can come from just the daily interactions and the chit chat in the hallway. And the key to good relationships is good communication, finding open communication, taking the time to communicate properly. Um, some of the problems that can arise in relationships in the workplace come from the stilted conversation and emails, where the potential for miscommunication is huge. Um, some of the things that are important to think about in relation to effective communication, this I think is also great advice for teaching, quite honestly, is the importance of knowing people's names, knowing how to pronounce them and use them, being interested in people's lives, and being sensible to the nonverbals, being yourself. Um, I've got appropriate self-disclosure appropriate being the key word here um, telling somebody else a little bit about yourself a little bit about your life also when it's learners is one way to show trust you're actually showing that you're willing to share a little bit of yourself in return for their trust um, particularly seeing people as conversation partners not as the audience um, really listening um, when others talk honestly if I was going to give the one number one tip for good communication is learn to listen more <coughs> excuse me and the last one I love be interested uh, rather than interesting. Um, and this is one of my favorite quotes, and I think it's great. So we have two ears and one mouth, so we can listen twice as much as we speak. And that's good advice for us, particularly as teachers, I can say. Let me go into work-life balance. So I really, really object to this idiom phrase, whatever we call it. <coughs> and perhaps you can work out why. Two parts of it I dislike. I dislike the notion that work and life is separate. We have one life and it is comprised of work and non-work. So this idea that you separate the two is very unrealistic, particularly for teachers where there's a strong spillover between different areas of our lives. And the notion of balance is problematic as it suggests there's some kind of magic perfect ratio and there's not. It's different for everybody and it changes across time. Sometimes we're happy with um, more work and less non-work and at other times we need to have a little bit more non-work time. Um, Claire Fox uses the word symbiosis. She talks about work-life symbiosis and I think that's a, a healthier way of reflecting on this. Um, I'm conscious of time so I'm going to zap on this. I apologize for this. But thinking about what you do to recharge yourself, these are some of the things that people have spoken about before, some of the things that you do. When I get people to talk about this, even just talking about things you enjoy doing, a little bit like when we had that positive activity earlier, even just talking about them can actually release some of that positive emotion and those feelings, just imagining it and just talking about it. And I've highlighted two that are particularly important. Meeting with friends and family. Um, I mentioned it earlier, having that social connection is a great way of recharging our batteries and getting energy. And going into nature, whether it's in a park or if you have a garden or if you're somewhere near the countryside and you can go out, humans actually, because of the Industrial Revolution, 
society develops in an industrial way much quicker than the human body has developed. And we really get a lot of positivity from being in nature and having time outdoors. If we can try and make a little bit of time for that, it can be a huge help. And this is called the, the health well-being triangle, that these three things contribute strongly to our well-being. Now, I am the last person that is going to preach to anybody about exercise, nutrition, and sleep. But one of the things that, that we can do with thinking about this is that we give conscious thought to how much quality sleep do we get because very often we cut time at the beginning and the end of the day to try and create to get more in and that's exactly the thing that we should be protecting so just putting this here is more to say these are things that are important to our well-being and our physical well-being and mental well-being and spending time attending to them in whatever way makes sense for us is important it is not supposed to be something where there's a sense of should um yeah, we'll just talk briefly about this last statement. Detachment is, this is coming out more and more in the organizational psychology literature. The idea of detachment is not just that we're doing something, but that we fully detach from work for a time. That we invest, and I've highlighted this, we invest in the quality of our non-work time. So I have to confess, I have times where I'm sat watching TV and I'm marking student papers at the same time as I'm watching TV and maybe drinking a glass of wine and talking to the family. And that can all be happening at the same time. And the notion of detachment and the quality of work time is that I say, work is in one place and I'm creating a boundary now and I'm, this is my non-work time and I'm going to make it top quality. Not compromised quality, but top quality. And the research about detaching from social media and telephones is quite clear that we can, we, we can get positivity, it's not all bad, we can get positivity about being connected and social media offers great opportunities to do what we're doing today, that's fantastic, that I'm sat in Austria in my house and I'm talking to you guys at Cornell, that's wonderful. Um, but it, the, the, the danger of being constantly available is draining because even if your phone is there and you hear it vibrate and you don't look at it, your mind is already distracted and thinking, I wonder who it is. It's already distracted. So making the time to be fully in the moment of wherever you happen to be, whether that's in a restaurant with friends or whether it is watching tea with your partner. But at that moment in time, you're just doing that and you're investing in the quality of that and enjoying that. And this is a, an important slide is when we talk about well-being, there is a sort of tendency to get into you should be doing this and you should be doing that. And that's the last thing we should do because that just creates more stress. So you have to, what, what I would like from today is that it just makes you think a little bit more about your well-being and that you go away and say, yeah, I'm going to prioritize things that are important to me. But that there's no sense that you should be doing this, that you should be doing that. that there's no way. I am the last person who could say that. And that isn't really the notion of this. More than anything, I just want you to go away and have thought a little bit about it. So the last one, time management, quite ironic given that I've got five minutes to go. Um, Time management is often misunderstood as making you more efficient to do more work. This is not the point of time management. The point of time management is to be more efficient so you have more time to do less, to do other things, to do non-work related things. So when we talk about time management strategies, I'm not suggesting these are things you can do so you can do yet more work. I'm hoping that these are things that you can do to be a little bit more efficient in how you work to create yourself a little bit of space so that you can detach and you can do the things that are rewarding for you and give you time with your family and friends and your hobbies and whatever it is you do that helps you to relax. Um, a key time management thing for teachers particularly is Parkinson's law. So work expands to fill the time you make available for it. If you have a half a day to do your lesson planning, it will take half a day. If you say, I have to do, realistically I can, I have to do all my lesson planning in two hours, it will happen in two hours. So this is a notion of time boxing, in that when we chunk our time and say, okay, look at what I have to do, realistically, how long will it take? And I set a boundary to it, and that's how long it has to take. And don't let it expand, because you'll just keep doing this, and it will just keep going. And there is a point of, of diminishing returns, particularly with lesson planning. So I think the research suggests that with lesson planning, there's a certain point at which it makes a difference to the pedagogical outcomes. And then after that point, we're just faffing. We're just faffing about and, and, and doing tweaks and making changes and slightly improving this and slightly improving that, but actually it's making very little pedagogical gain. So there's a point at which you have to say, 
this is actually going to be good enough for my teaching and the students are going to benefit from this. And after that, that's, that's just faffing. And making time, boxing time to recharge your batteries isn't this optional extra. And, um, you know, most cultures have a weekend for a reason. You have, you need this time to re-energize yourself so that you work better in the rest of the time that you're having to work. And particularly with, with teachers, for me, I, Sunday is one of my most important work days. It's when I get stuff done ready for the week that's about to start. And so I have become quite careful about when I plan time and when I plan some free time. So I think time management is about also putting your free time in your diary and making it just as important as everything else. Um, some of the time management tips, be realistic about what you can achieve and what you can do. Building buffer zones, this is something that I learned only last year um, and I found it really helpful. Is often I would plan things right next to each other, this and then I would have this and then I would have this and then I would have this. And if one thing got delayed, which inevitably it did, I'd get really stressed because I'd have to rush to this and that would be late. And so building in buffer zones is like having a little bit of slack time. It's just give you a chance to make transitions between things you have to do. Setting boundaries to weekends and evenings. Um, I'm realistic enough and I've had enough teaching experience to know that, that there are evenings and there are weekends that's going to go to work. But also then saying, you know what, tonight is a night off and this is a night with my family and this is a night with my friends and tonight I'm not doing any work. And not to feel guilty about it, but to make a clear space and put it in your diary and that space is special and that time is dedicated to something that's important. So fixing time for hobbies, sport and friends. I've talked a little bit about time boxing. Some of you may know the Pomodoro technique. Um, it doesn't work for me, but it does for some people. This is where you set a timer and so you work really intensively for 10 minutes and then you take five minutes off to have a little break and then you come back and then you work 10 intensively for another 10 minutes and then you take five minutes off. It's from the, from the tomato oven, the kitchen timer for routine. The student used to do this and apparently it makes you very effective. And the idea is that you work very intensively for a period of time with no distractions, very concentrated, a fixed amount of time, and then give yourself a bit of breathing space and then come back. Um, many of you may have heard, I think it's Mark Twain, I'm not sure, I think it's Mark Twain, who said, eat your frogs first. Um, this is to overcome the procrastination problem. This is the idea that you tackle the thing you want to do least first and get it out of the way. Um, again, not everybody thinks that that's the right way to go. Some people like to do a little tiny activity first it gives them a feeling of success that they've accomplished something and then they move on to the bigger things it depends who you are but for some people getting rid of that thing that's blocking you can help you to actually move forward um and yeah dare i say it i'm probably i really shouldn't say that learning to say no um when we understand particularly as teachers we often want to help and we want to be there for other people we're very other oriented as a profession um, it can be very difficult for us to say no without feeling bad about it but we, when we understand that saying no to one thing means you allow yourself time to say yes to something else. It's just about setting priorities. And this is essentially what time management is. Time management is thinking about what is important to you, and that's in life more generally, and thinking where your priorities are, and then looking at how you're spending your time. And having a kind of honest conversation with yourself, if these things are important to me, where am I actually spending my time? Do those things actually match up? And sometimes we find that maybe there's a bit of a mismatch there. And I like this quote. I thought I'd put this in. Many of us feel stressed and get overwhelmed, not because we're taking on too much, but because we're taking on too little of what it is that really strengthens us. And I think that's kind of nice. It's not saying you have to cut out everything. It's just maybe we need to be doing a little bit more of some of the things that give us strength. So these are some of the summaries of today's webinar. These are things that um, I'm going to, I assume, or I, we didn't talk Angelica, but I'll let you have the slides if, if people think it's useful or you'll see these afterwards. These are some things just to reflect on, to think about for yourself that might help you think about your own well-being. Um, I really don't want to have been prescriptive in any way, but hope to have kind of given you a prompt and give you the courage to, to be positive and, and not feel guilty about focusing on your well-being. Um, for me, teacher professional well-being is not an indulgence. It's an absolute necessity for good teaching. If you look after yourself and you're in the right place, you will teach to the best of your abilities and everybody benefits. You benefit, your students benefit, your colleagues benefit and your family benefit as well. If you want to know any more, there's a book that has some things about this. There's another one on its way. And please feel free to get in touch and drop me an email if you have any questions. I hope it was useful for you. Thank you.
Wonderful. Thera, thank you so much for this very insightful um, presentation and getting us thinking about what we need to do to be healthy ourselves. Um, so if you do have any questions specifically for Sarah, by all means, please contact her. And um, if you do share the presentation slides, we will certainly share those. Um, there were a number of teachers who are teaching right now who couldn't be here. So a lot of people have requested access to all your materials. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> wonderful. Well, thank you again so much, Sarah. This is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.